Hong Kong Community Ministry Sunday Worship, February 18. If this is your first time joining us on Facebook or YouTube, please allow us to welcome you by introducing yourself through the Facebook comment box. Thank you. I would like to remind everyone to turn off your watch alarm and phone. Thank you. Please listen to our caller. Give praise to the law. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the law rejoice. Sing to the law, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the law and the most mercy of praise. He is to be feared among above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the law make the heavens. Spandor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his during praise. Ascribe to the law all you families of nations. Ascribe to the law glory and strength. Ascribe to the law the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. First Chronicles chapter 16, 8 to 10, 23 to 29. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for creating the heaven and earth, all living creatures on earth. Thank you for creating man and his helper, woman. Thank you for leading the man and leave his wife, husband and mother and be united to his wife. And they will become one flesh. This is your vision and great plan for man and woman so that they can increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, or over every living creature that move on the ground. May all the men and women come to excel your name on high. May your name be glorified on the whole earth. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Please welcome our chorus team, led by John Yan. <clears throat> good morning, guys. How you doing? Good, good. All right. Um, let's please rise as you worship God. All right. Let's bow our head as we come before the Lord. Okay, God, thank you that you're here with us and that um, you love us, Lord. You created us. And that uh, you let us know that we are loved. I uh, pray that as you sing, uh, please be with us. May your spirit come down. Um, and that let us love you. And that um, let us love each other as well. I pray in your name. Amen. <laughs> oh God of creation. There at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, he spoke to the dark and flesh of the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breast the planets form and The stars are made to worship, so will I I can see your heart in everything you've made 
And a burning star ascend thy visor. If creation's angel praises, so will I. And so will I. you speak a hundred billion creatures patch your breath and we love it and pursue what you say if I know it is your nature so will I I can see your heart Stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. No. If the ocean draw your greatness, so will I. If everything exists to lift you high, so will I. Some of all the praises still fall short. And we're seen again a hundred billion times. Oh. As you speak, a hundred billion fill it disappear. Well, you lost your life so I could find it here. If you left the grave, the man so. I can see your heart and everything you've done. Every pen is on the front of all the
guys. The word, the Lord won't leave us behind because we belong. In this house that his blood has bought, as I bear his image, oh, may I not profane the holiness I hold in this earth. I want you to sing along. Frame. And I belong to the I belong to the Lord, I am not my own. Oh, I will honor Him, for this I know, I belong to the Lord, I am not my own. And even He did me, I am not my own. The measure of my word is in love alone. He declares my standing, he declares my stay. So I will know myself by the I belong to the Lord, oh, I am not my own. I belong to the Lord, I am not my own. Oh, I will honor Him for this I know. I belong to the Lord.
was all about. I never felt like any real connection. I just went through the emotions. But that kind of changed. Well, that changed, um, I think it was like a summer a couple years ago when we went to visit my grandpa in California. And something you should know about my grandpa is that he's a really stoic guy. He's really independent. And he doesn't really always accept help. He's like very self-confident himself. And he doesn't like to admit that he's wrong. And um, that summer when we, when we visited, he got baptized. And watching him get baptized and accepting Jesus Christ as a savior and that he's a sinner, like, and being filled with like the Holy Spirit and just like so joyful, it made me reflect on myself. And watching him get baptized, it also made me feel joyful and that's something that I always carried with me when we got back and throughout my life. Um, there's a verse that I'd like to share with you all today. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Um, if anyone has taken Mrs. Deep's class, you should know this. Um, and it goes like this. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. I want to glorify God and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I know that I'm a sinner, sinner and I admit my sins. Um, Jesus is my Savior. He died on the cross to save me from my sins. And by the Lord's grace, I have been saved through faith. Met through my faith in Jesus. Thank you. Um, the third song that we will be singing today is Amazing Grace. Um, I chose this song because it was actually my grandma's favorite song. She played this song during her baptism, and I thought it was fitting that we also sing it today. Thank you. we get set, feel free to stand and join us as we sing Amazing Grace. <clears throat> all right. So we're going to add a little swing on it, all right? All right. That's just some fun.
All right, let's bow our head. Dear God, what amazing grace to save our sin, to save our life, God, that we will work and we will walk in turmoil. We were um, suffering before, God, and you let us out. You show us the way, and you are the way, Lord. I uh, pray that you can be with us as we listen to the sermon. Uh, be with Pastor Nathan as he will preach. I pray that you can be with all of us. Let us love you with all our hearts because you have loved us first. Uh, I pray that, um, yeah, we can glorify your name. I pray your name. Everyone say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for our praise chorus uh, team lead, uh, John Yan, and the team to lead our worship inspiration. And again, welcome to Cosborne Community Ministry Sunday Worship, February 18. If this is your first time joining us on Facebook or YouTube, please allow us to welcome you at the, fa um, at the Facebook comment box. Now I would like to um, introduce our um, first. I would like to uh, remind you how to uh, access our um, website. So please go to www.cbcgl.org website and scroll down, and you will see this. Subscribe to our news at the bottom of our website. And click and choose the content you would like to subscribe. Currently, we have three categories. Cosborne Community Ministry, Children Ministry, and Youth Ministry. Please give your confirmation in your mailbox. Second, I would like to sh show you how to assess our exciting weekly event links. First, access the resources at the upper right corner of top menu, and then click the useful links to access our Wednesday prayer, Friday night fellowship, and Sunday school Zoom links by clicking the highlight event title. Third, please read our Cosborne Community Ministry information. Now, I would like to um, select three announcements for today. Sorry. First announcement, we like you to assess our, um, join us for our Easter family festivity. Co-worker sign up is on um, our Easter family festivity uh, is hosting on March 30th, Saturday. And the co-worker time is from 10.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And the event time is from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. So, dear brothers and sisters, we invite you to serve at the 2024 Easter family festivity. This is a great church outreach event with many attendees from our labors, like around 200 kids from 2023. And a great opportunity to make our church and us a venue to be blessed to our community. We need many co-workers to serve at different roles. So please scan um, the QR code on the right or sign up by sending email to cbcgl.localchurch at low.church. Second announcement, slide four. Baptism classes are happening. We will have our next baptism service on Easter, March 31st. To be baptized, you must attend the baptism class first. The youth baptism classes begin on February 25th. If you are interested in being baptized, please contact 
Elder Charles Worm or Deacon Wicker. For Cost One Community Ministry, please contact Pastor Nathan Williams. Come to baptism class to learn why we baptize people and what is necessary for baptism and what are the rights and responsibilities you have as someone who is baptized. The last announcement is on slide six, keeping it vertical. Our midweek women's Bible study called Keeping It Vertical meets at one o'clock on the first and third uh, Tuesday of each month. And this coming week, that is February 20th. And we are studying Fruit of the Spirit. Come join us in a person, in person, in a sharing and caring environment as we learn of God's great love for us. All women are welcome. Please contact Jean if you would like to join at uh, her email and let's grow together. Today we are very happy that we will have our Cosborn Community Ministry Pastor Nathan to deliver a sermon for us. And it is based on Genesis. And the title is, okay. Uh, Oh, the title is on screen, sorry. It's on Genesis chapter 2, 4 to 25. The Lost Priorities for Humanity. Let's welcome Pastor Nathan. Thanks, Sam. All right, brothers and sisters, it is good to be with you this morning. Thank you for being here and uh, hearing from God's word from Genesis. Um, please... Join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, we don't pray simply because we don't know how to do transitions in worship service times. We pray because we need you. We ask that you would focus our hearts, give us attentive ears, uh, and help us to hear what you have to say to us today so that you may change us, so we may be the people you want us to be and do the things you want us to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. It is a fact of life, a fact of life, that we will not get what we want if we have the wrong priorities. For example, if you only ever prioritize the urgent over the important, then the important things never take place. Sure, there are times when the urgent things need to take priority, like going to the bathroom when you need to go, uh, but we, we have to prioritize important things to be able to enjoy them and encourage their growth. So, for example, if the dishes are urgent, but the time reading to your kids is important, prioritize reading to your kids and do the dishes afterwards. Because if you only prioritize the urgent, then the dishes will get done, but you may not have time and energy for your kids. Another example of wrong priorities is seen in credit card spending without full payment of your credit card. If we prioritize experiences and delights of consumption, we begin to rack up credit card debt. And if we prioritize having what we want, when we want it, now over delayed gratification, or not buying it until we actually have enough money, then we'll end up in a world of financial hurt. See, credit card companies are glad for you to maintain a balance on your credit cards because then you have to pay them interest, often exorbitant interest. And you get stuck sometimes behind a huge wave of debt that you can't seem to clear because the debt, in some cases, even exceeds monthly income in, in really bad cases. If, if you make the poor financial choice of spending on a credit card without fully paying off your monthly balance on time, you become a slave to consumer debt. Wrong priorities can lead to ruin. Again, you won't get you what you want if you have wrong priorities. This is seen in wisdom statements like... Whatsoever a man sows, that he also will reap. So if you invest your time and your energy and your passion, for example, into your career, you will likely end up having career advancement. It's likely. But you will only have so much time and energy in a single day. So if you prioritize career over family, you'll lose your family in the process. You want loving family relationships, but if you retreat into work 
because you prioritize personal comfort and conflict avoidance over having the hard but necessary conversations with your family, uh, then you won't be able to help your relationships grow. And if we state this truth positively, you need to have right priorities and pursue the priorities to get the things that you want. You know this to be the case with long-term goals. If you want, for example, to get a college degree, you have to study, you work hard, you save up, you spend money going to college. If you want to buy a home, you work up to save money for a down payment so that you can have an affordable interest rate for your mortgage. Or if you want to get married, you work on becoming the kind of person who someone would want to marry, being a mature, responsible, generous, loving person. All of this to say that our priorities matter. They kind of dictate how we live our lives. But I will tell you this, the Lord's priorities matter even more than your priorities, because, well, they're the Lord's. Last week, we started our sermon series in Genesis by looking at Genesis chapter 1. We answered the basic worldview question, where do we come from? We heard from God's word that our origin story clearly states God created all things, including us, giving humanity purpose and worth. This week we continue in the series of Genesis in, chapters two, in chapter 2, verses 4 to 25. In this chapter, God displays, the Lord God displays three of his priorities for humanity. But before we look at chapter 2, let me give you a couple quick facts. See, chapter 2 is not written by a different author, even though the style of chapter 2 is very different from chapter 1. Sure, the focus is a different, but that doesn't mean it's a contradiction to... Uh, be to chapter 1. Chapter 2 is a literary flashback of what happens on day 6, specifically verse 27 of chapter 1. So don't think that chapter 1 and chapter 2 are, are in conflict because they're not. Second, Moses is writing to the people of Israel who had come out of Egypt. They know that God is powerful and the second chapter shows them that God is personal. So as we listen to and understand God's word from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25, we'll see three priorities that the Lord has for humanity. So please turn in your Bible, if you do not have it, Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25. I'll be reading from the ESV. Please follow along as I read. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and watering the whole face of the ground. Then, verse 7, the Lord God formed the man of the dust, formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. Uh, It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to all the birds of heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman 
because she was taken out of a man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, it's the final verse. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In verses 4 to 8, we see the first priorities of the Lord for humanity. The Lord God made us for a loving relationship with Him. He is our maker. He made us for a relationship in which He is our master. So look with me at verse 4. It starts with, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And if you've read through the book of Genesis, you will see that this introductory phrase shows up ten times more after this. In each of those ten instances, it talks about a person, but here it talks about the heavens and the earth. And it basically means, this is what happened to the heavens and the earth when the Lord God created them. Or another way to paraphrase it would be to say, this is what became of the heavens and the earth. So it's kind of giving us a signal of what follows. This is what became of the heavens and the earth. We are introduced at the end of verse 4 to the Lord God. Again, the Bible is all about him, but what's interesting here in verse 4 is that out of the whole Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the title, the Lord God, is found only here in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, except for one instance in, in the book of Exodus. The Lord is the word Yahweh, which God had revealed to Moses as he brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt to bring them out of slavery. But why is Moses using that now? Because Moses is the author. Well, in chapter 1, Moses had highlighted the powerful name of God using the word Elohim, which is his name, God, which highlights his power. And in, verse, and in chapter 2, he's highlighting the personal nature of God. God has a name that he gave to the people of Israel. So this is my name. They should tell them. So in chapter 2, Moses is highlighting that God is both powerful and personal. And after introducing us to uh, the Lord God, um, we find the setting for what happens in verses 5 and 6. There was no bush of the field, you can read wild plant, and there was no small plant of the field, you can read cultivated plant. And we are told two reasons. First, there was no uh, rain yet, the Lord had not caused it to rain, and second, there was no man to cultivate the land. And sure, a rising mist from the there was a mist rising from the land to water the face of the whole ground, but there weren't plants just yet. In this setting, the Lord God takes some dirt, perhaps some mud because of the mist, and he uses it to make, uh, to, make to shape uh, something that turned into a man. God got his hands dirty. As a potter does when he forms and shapes the piece that she is working on. See, the, the verb formed, as one commentator notes, means to shape and mold or implies that God deliberately did this with loving care. It describes the work of an artist. The Lord God is an artist, even a potter, and he crafts a masterpiece. But the Lord isn't content just to make great sculptures. Nope, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. I tend to envision something like CPR. I don't know about you when you read through this, but I'm, I'm thinking CPR. Um, but we see in this that the Lord God is the life giver. The Lord God is someone who breathes life, physical, mental, spiritual life, into this one who bears his image. Moreover, we see that the Lord is the self-giving one. God gives himself by breathing into Adam. Because this, and this shows us that apart from God, man would not have lived. Which kind of echoes what Jesus says, or is a foreshadowing of what Jesus will say, apart from me you can do nothing. But when God breathed into his nostrils, the man became a living creature. God gave him life. Man did not give himself life. God gave him life. And as if giving the man life wasn't enough, the Lord God also plants a garden in Eden, in the east, and he puts the man in it. He gives the man life and a place to enjoy it. 
Eden is a name that refers to delight or abundant waters. That's a paradise. Matthew Henry writes of this arrangement. He says, No delights can be agreeable nor satisfying to the soul, but those that the Lord himself has provided and appointed for it. He says, There's no true paradise except of God's planting. And take note, the man did not decide that he wanted to go to the garden. It's like, hey, there's a pretty garden over there. I want to go. No. Uh, God put him there. After all, this is God's world. He is our maker. And because he's our maker, he is our master. He determines where we live so that we might reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, as Paul states in Acts chapter 17. We see in the first five verses that the first priority of the Lord God is that we would live with the Lord God as our maker, as our master. He created humanity for a loving relationship with him. The Lord God has desired an intimate, joyous, loving relationship with humanity since the very beginning of human history. My question is, do you have the same priority? Do you have the same priority? Do you desire a loving relationship with the Lord God? Why did God make you? He made you in order to have a loving relationship with you. Do you have a loving relationship with the Lord God? A personal relationship with the Lord God where you know Him because He knows your name and you belong to Him. After all, He is our Lord. He is our Maker, our Master, which means He can tell us what to do. And he gives good rules to follow. We see that in the following verses. Look with me at verses 9 to 17. If you have the Bible, look in it. In these verses, we see the Lord's second priority for humanity. Mission, specifically work. Verses 9 to 14 describe the setting of the garden, which sounds more like an orchard. In verse 9, the Lord God makes trees that are pleasant to the eye and good for food. These include the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we see in verse 9 that the Lord God is a forester among his other skills and abilities. In verses 10 to 14, we are told about four rivers, two of which, the Tigris and the Euphrates, still flow through modern-day Iraq. I don't know if you've seen that video, maybe in... uh, like seventh grade, and my kids have shown it to me. It's like the Euphrates River. It's the Euphrates River. Well, uh, it is the Euphrates River. It's the one that is in modern day Iraq. Um, but the other two rivers, the Gihon and the Pishon, we don't know where those are at. Um, so they're lost to history. After explaining the setting, we see in verse 15, which is an echo of verse 8 some clarification. The reason the Lord God put the man in the garden was to work and to keep it. Friends, think of the implications. Work is good. Work was given to humanity before it was frustrated by sin. The man is to make purposeful contributions. This means that work is not a punishment. It is a good thing. It allows us to express our agency, our ability to use our gifts and our skills. It is part of man's dominion over the earth through which he cares for it and tends it. So the Lord God gives man a mission, namely work, specifically to tend the garden. And the mission that the Lord God gives the man continues in verses 16 and 17. Man is not only to work the garden, that's important, it needs to be done, but the man is also to obey. To obey the commands of the Lord God. I mean, after all, he's our maker, he's our master. We are to obey what he says. We're to do what God says. So God tells the man in verse 16, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. And this phrase, surely eat, means... You may feast, and you will feast continually. In other words, eating, you can eat to your heart's content. Just enjoy. Go ahead, surely eat from any tree of the garden. It's great. In feasting, continue to feast. As long as you make the good choices, you will continue to have good choices. And in verse 17, we find the first prohibition in the Bible. 
A prohibition is you can't do something. The Lord God tells the man, you shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the reason for it, the Lord gives him, is for when you eat of it, for if you eat of it, you will surely die. This phrase, surely die, means dying, you will die continually. The certainty of death is emphasized rather than the timing of death. Often we're like, hey, they ate from the tree. I read ahead. They didn't die immediately. What's going on? No, what God's telling is you certainly will die. In other words, God's essentially warning Adam, if you make the bad choice of disobeying me, you will have fewer good choices until you have no choices left. Because that's what bad choices do to us, right? Bad choices force us into a corner so that we have further bad choices to make more bad choices until we cease to have any choice. Which is what God was warning Adam about. But that kind of raises an obvious question. Why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? What's going on there? So just as the tree of the life presumably gave life, so too the tree of the knowledge of good and evil also gave the knowledge of good and evil. How did it give knowledge of good and evil? Well, this kind of knowledge was experiential knowledge. They can have experience of what is good and experience of what is evil. So the way that it gave knowledge of good was through its presence. Its presence gave experiential knowledge of what is good. It is good for man to keep God's rules. That's good. It's good to obey God. When we keep God's rules, we have more options, greater freedoms. But if the man were to eat of the tree, he would have experiential knowledge of evil. Eating its fruit gave him experiential knowledge of evil. It is evil to break God's rules. When we break God's rules, we have less freedom, more slavery, and we proceed further and further into self-destructive patterns which lead to death. And it's not just, you know, literal physical death. It means death of our relationships, death of our choices, our options. We, we say we want freedom, and we turn away from God by saying, I'm going to do what you don't want me to do, God. And then what do we get? We get worse and worse things. Because that's how evil works. More on that next week. One commentator notes, as it stood prohibited, it presents the alternative to discipleship. To be self-made, resting one's knowledge, satisfactions, and values from the created world in defiance of the creator. Say, I know better than you, God. I'm going to go ahead and do things apart from you. So I understand why we ask why the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the garden. I mean, we've read chapter 3, but we'll get there next week. Okay, another thing I want you to note is that God, in his goodness, gave man free access to all the trees of the garden. And he, and he prohibited eating from this one. This provides man with a logical possibility of choice. Freedom of will. And both of which, choice, freedom of will, are necessary for love to be expressed. You cannot force someone to love someone else. It doesn't work that way. Love is freely given. And freedom implies the possibility of choice. So, one possible reason why God put this tree in the garden was to grant man the ability to love through the freedom to choose. He could choose to love God through obedience which is consistent with what the Word of God says. If you will love me, you'll keep my commandments or disobey. You could choose to love God or choose to disobey. But his job was to obey. His job was to obey his master. God's second priority for humanity is to give him a mission. In Genesis 2, that mission is work, tending the garden and obeying the commands of the Lord God. So too, when we start with the Lord, our God, as our master, we can receive our mission, our work. We are called to love God first and foremost and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We are to work in this world using our God-given abilities and talents in order to do the work that God wants us to do in order to advance His purposes in this world. 
The Lord God's second priority for humanity is mission, meaningful work, which includes obedience. Our work is an expression of our obedience to His Word. That's why we work. Not because work is the way we make money, and that's how I I live in this world. No, work is done out of obedience to God. And it just so happens that people pay us for the work that we do so that we can use money to live. Because reality is that God is our maker, He is our master, and He's given us work to do. So the Lord's third priority for man can be found in verses 18 to 25. So priority one, master, a relationship with Him. Priority two, mission, meaningful work, which includes obedience. And priority three, mate, companionship for humanity. Look at verses 18 and 20. These verses describe the setting of the third priority. First, it is not good for man to be alone. Man's aloneness is the first thing that the Lord God says is not good. If you read from the beginning of Genesis, this is the first time that God says, this is not good. But how was it that man was alone? He had all the animals and God's presence, but one thing that the man didn't have was anyone who was like him. So God says, I will make a helper fit for him. To have someone fit for him means someone that would be another with whom the man could be fruitful, uh, could fulfill God's creation commands, which are to subdue the earth or have dominion over it, to be fruitful and multiply, bearing God's image through mutual support and companionship. So God says he will make Adam, the man, a helper. Now hear me out. If you're not listening, start listening. Thank you. The word helper here does not imply someone who's lesser in being or lesser in worth or lesser in person, purpose. Instead, the word helper implies someone who supplies strength in an area that is lacking. It's a word that's used of God himself throughout the Old Testament. The helper would be someone who would complement the man, the way that a harmony complements a melody when they're played together. The harmony is not lesser but it adds depth, it adds beauty, it adds delight. In short, the helper would be an indispensable companion. Matthew Henry writes, in our best state in this world, we still have need of another's help, for we are members one of another. We must therefore be glad to receive help from others, to give help to others, as there is occasion. So in verses 19 to 20, God first checks with the animals he created. I get it. Some people love their animals. Animals can be great companions. And so God brought animals to the man, and the man named them. Through naming them, he demonstrates his authority over them. But for the man, Adam, no suitable helper was found. There was no animal corresponding to him. For fit for him to fulfill God's purpose with the animals. So God went to work again. Look at, at verses 21 to 22. The Lord God put the man to sleep. Friends, that means the Lord God is the first anesthesiologist. Just kind of put him under. And sure, the sleep helped the man not be cognizant of what was happening, but the sleep also shows that the man did not actively contribute. He wasn't picking the quality and characteristics that he wanted. No, he had no active part in creating this incredible gift. God did. So God took from the man's side, like our our passage, the ESV uses the word rib, and God performed surgery, which means the Lord God is a surgeon. What? And the Lord God is a builder. When it says that he, he shaped, he fashioned, he built this part of Adam into a woman. And then God is like an Amazon delivery person because he brings the woman to the man. He doesn't have to do anything. He's just like, here you go. Now, perhaps you wish the Lord would bring you a spouse, because I know I did when I was in high school, and the truth is God can. God did it for Adam. God has done it for many here. Uh, God can bring you a spouse. Trust him for it. And then when Adam came to, um, we hear his first recorded words in the Bible, and they are poetry. It's Hebrew poetry. He says in verse 23, saying like, This 
this, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He's saying with awe and delight, this human that you brought me, this is it. This is what I've been seeking the whole time. To say that she was bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh is to say that she was made of the same stuff. They were both um, made in the image of God, and he names her woman. And in naming her, he's taking responsibility for her, exercising the God-given authority that he has. Matthew Henry says it best when he wrote, the woman was made out of the rib of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor made out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, near his heart to be, lo- to be beloved by him. Now, brothers and sisters, if you somehow think that this text is sexist or oppressively patriarchal, you are committing the error of reading the text with a modern perspective. Verses 18 to 23 are exceptional among ancient Near Eastern texts. One author explains, the ancient Near Eastern text contains no account of the creation of women. Other ancient Near Eastern texts don't mention the creation of women. They don't. Moses, however, devoted six verses to her formation in this passage, and how many does he give to Adam? One. Man, if you don't realize that women are complex, figure it out. It's a, and it's a good thing. It's a really good thing. And it's at this point at the end of verse 23 that Moses provides a summary. In verse 24, it's a summary for the reader describing what typically happens. And in verse 25, is a summary of the couple, setting, which sets up what happens in chapter 3. So what does Moses have to say to the reader in verse 24? Well, because the Lord is a matchmaker, a man will leave his father and mother. This means that the husband and wife have new priorities, one that, ones that override duty even to one's parents, which might be shocking, but it's true. To leave father and mother means to sever the cord of dependence, be it financial or emotional or social. Practically, it means things like not going to your parents if you have a problem with your spouse. Why? Because you and your spouse are a new family unit. You work together to solve problems. And you recognize that most problems in marriage are due to our own selfishness. Leaving allows you to form a new family unit, and the formation of a new family unit happens as you cleave to your spouse. The man and woman leave their parents and are united to each other. The word united here suggests passion and permanence. And, and in this unity, they become one flesh. Yes, marriage is a physical relationship, but the one flesh union isn't, as one commentator writes, just a sexual union or children conceived or even spiritual and emotional relationship, though all of these are involved in the one flesh union. Rather, marriage creates a similar kinship relationship uh, that exists between husband and wife as would exist between uh, a son and their father or a daughter and their, their parents, Right? Because they're family. You, you become one family, one flesh. And it's in marriage that we can experience the blessing that was first experienced by the first man and first woman. We see it in verse 25. Verse 25 is the only time that nakedness is expressed positively in the whole Bible. Why? Because they were both naked and were not ashamed. They experienced vulnerability without fear. They had nothing to hide. That's why a lot of times people have nightmares where they're like standing in front of people and they realize they didn't have clothes on. That's a nightmare because they're completely exposed, completely vulnerable. But they were completely vulnerable and had nothing to fear. They could be fully themselves as God had made them to be. They experienced confidence without questioning. What they had to give to each other was good. And they experienced delight without judgment. They were made for each other. Literally made for each other. They had no reason to be ashamed. No reason to be judged or questioning or fearful. 
Brothers and sisters, this section shows God's priorities and intentions for marriage. We can see at least three things that God designed marriage to be. First, marriage is God-ordained. He made both people. He brought them together. He designed them to complement one another. Neither was incomplete on their own. They were complete individuals who complemented each other. Moreover, marriage is for one man and for one woman. It is not for a man and a man. It is not for a woman and a woman. It is not for a man and two women or three women. It is not for one woman and two or three men. It is single and exclusive. God designed marriage to be between a man and a woman. And marriage is given to make couples into one flesh, expressing unity, passion, permanence, delight, fruitfulness, and kinship. This means that both husband and wife put their spouse's interest above all others, even their own, or their parents, or their children. Brothers and sisters, if you're married and you put your children's interests above your spouse's, you're putting things in the wrong order. Marriage is a gift from God to be enjoyed on God's terms. We were made to to signify this one flesh union, and even more if you, if you read chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians. But that's for another time. Okay, this morning, we have seen three of the Lord's priorities for humanity it's from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25. First, he is our master. God made us for a loving relationship with him, where we do what he says. See, God is good. He's not a tyrant. God is gracious. He's not capricious. God is reliable. He's not untrustworthy. So, brothers and sisters, make God's priorities your first priority. Grow in your relationship with God. God made you. He is better than you can hope or imagine, but the problem is that we sin. We turn away from God rather than turning towards God. We deserve death for our rebellion against God and His good rules, and that might seem extreme, but it's not. Evil done against an infinite being deserves infinite punishment. So God knows that we cannot fix our relationship on our own with him. The cost is too great, and our tendency is that we run and hide. So God did what was necessary for you and I to have a relationship. He sent his only son to be our savior. Jesus lived a perfect life, died in our place, and rose again from the dead to give new life to all who believe in him. He calls us to repent and believe the good news. We are to, like Betty shared, put our trust in Jesus and turn away from our sin, living for him and through him and with him. And as we grow in our relationship with God by getting to know him through reading his word and through prayer, through fellowship with other brothers and sisters, uh, we continue to increasingly put our trust in the Lord, knowing that he is our master. So we want to do what he says. He gets to tell us how to live our lives. Second of the Lord's priorities for humanity, mission. Learn the gifts and skills that God has given you and use them to meaningfully contribute to the good of others and the glory of God. In other words... Work. Work is good. Work enables us to advance God's kingdom and his purposes in this world through caring for creation and loving others. And if you don't have the Lord as your master, you will not be able to fulfill your mission. You'll wonder hopelessly if what you do even matters or is even significant, and you won't have a way to definitively say that it is apart from the Lord God. That's why work is so frustrating for so many people is because they don't have the Lord as their master. And they're trying to give themselves to their work and make their work their master, which is futility. And if you don't have your master settled and you aren't sure about your mission, you should not be pursuing the third priority. You should not seek a mate. Work on your relationship with the Lord. Love him first. One author I read this week said that teenagers can feel like finding a spouse is the key to entering adulthood. And that real life won't really get started until that goal is accomplished. But the reality, the truth is that while marriage is unique and irreplaceable, teenagers can work on prioritizing friendships, family relationships, and neighborly connections. Brothers and sisters, if you are not mature enough to get married, prioritize friendship. Who needs to date in high school? I mean, what can you get from dating in high school that you cannot get from quality friendship? And if you cannot get quality friendship, 
And if quality friendship cannot provide the thing that you're seeking, something like physical intimacy, should you have it presently? But if you are mature enough to get married, talk to God about providing a spouse if that's the desire the Lord has given you. God can and does bring people together, but what good is there being together if you don't have the same master? What good is there in being together if the Lord has given you different missions, so you're pulling in different directions constantly? Can you serve the Lord faithfully while being in a committed relationship with this other person? Because if you can't, it's likely time to call off the relationship. The, Lord, the Lord's priorities matter. And the order of the, of the order of the Lord's priorities matter. It is master, then mission, then mate. But if you are already married, love your spouse best by loving the Lord first. After all, marriage is his idea, and he richly blesses it when we live our marriages the way that he calls us to, with the husband self-sacrificially serving his wife and the wife self-sacrificially submitting to the godly leadership of her husband. So as we head into February school break, which starts tomorrow, where are you at in making the Lord's priorities your own? Is he your master? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you seek to fulfill your mission and the work he provides? And are you pursuing your mate in ways that please the Lord God? Make the Lord's priorities your priority. I invite the praise team to lead us in our closing song, after which we will sing, have the benediction and sing the doxology. I invite you all to stand as we sing the response song. You know, um, we're all sinners. Uh, we can't save it by our own. Um, we need uh, the blood of Jesus. We need a touch of heaven. speak to me now you have all my attention I will linger and listen I can't miss a thing Lord I know I'm almost bored of you my heart wants something new so I surrender all I want is to live within your love. 
be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. In your love and affection, it's the sweetest of all. Heart wants more of you, my heart wants something new, so I surrender all. All I want is to live within your be undone by who you are my desire is to know you deeper lord i will open up again throw my fears into the wind i am desperate for a touch of heaven oh chapter 39 it talks about God's love so as we sing this last time in the chorus I want you guys to really reflect reflect off the love of God in the lyrics and just really meditate off the sermon we just had all I want is to live within your be undone by who you are my desire is to know you deeper lord i will open up again throw my fears into the wind i am desperate for a touch of heaven oh oh
feel free um, to uh, remain standing for the blessing, um, which is uh, a benediction which comes from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, verse 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please join us as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. This concludes our service. Please go in peace.